first at four, Sky 4 just flew over the St. Clair River where ice jams are causing serious flooding. We have an update on the Coast Guard response. Ben. And Karen, unfortunately, melting is not a word we're going to be using in the forecast past the next 24 hours. A big descent into winter is just around the corner. Also ahead, tears in a virtual court hearing. We're getting a look at the man accused in the first murder in Clawson since 2004. And here's Paula. More and more districts are discussing how to extend the school year, but... This school year in and of itself can't even last five minutes more. So where do we go from here? Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Drew. First at 4, Taylor police believe speed and alcohol are to blame in a car crash that killed a child. It happened just after midnight at North Line and Telegraph Roads. Police say a 12-year-old girl and her aunt were traveling west on North Line when they were T-boned by the driver of a Ford Escape. The girl died from her injuries. Her aunt is expected to be okay. A 20-year-old man is in custody right now, facing drunk driving charges. Also getting a look at the Clawson man charged in connection with that city's first homicide since 2004. 37-year-old Stephen Rogers sobbed in court during this morning's virtual arraignment. He was arrested early Sunday after police say he broke into a home on Nakota Street and attacked a woman. Then, while he was being arrested, police say he said something that led them to his home, where they found a man dead inside. Rogers pled not guilty to several charges, including open murder and home invasion. The judge denied bond. All right, take a look at this mess. It is all along the St. Clair River. Ice jams have led to flooding that has rising waters just surrounding homes and businesses. Sky 4 was just over the scene this afternoon near Point Drive over in East China Township. Several main roads and homes from Algonac to Port Huron remain flooded. It obviously looks so awful, but we are told the water has gone down about a foot. The U.S. Coast Guard says two ice-breaking ships have been conducting ice-breaking operations to ease the flooding. Ahead at 5, we're going to have a live update on the flood's impact along the river. The flood warning remains in effect until 10 tomorrow morning. All right, so we do need to monitor conditions along the river. Let's bring in Ben Bailey for what we can expect. And that, that, that amount of ice is such a huge problem. And like you said, it's not melting anytime soon. No, this was really the warmest temperature that we're going to see probably for the next 10 days, Karen. And it's most certainly going to be the most amount of sunshine that we see. But it's also important to note the expiration time on this warning is really kind of meaningless because there's no meteorological reason it was it will expire at 10 o'clock tomorrow. It all depends on how soon they can get ships out there to break up that ice. And as you mentioned, they're on it, uh, but not completely done. So uh, just take that 10 o'clock time frame with a grain of salt. Could go a little bit longer than that. And the Weather Service is saying that flooding could potentially even get worse than it actually is right now. But man, that sun looks nice and those temperatures even nicer. 38 in Detroit right now, 37 in Ann Arbor. We're seeing right at that 32 degree mark there in Lapeer. But things are going to change dramatically. Weather impacts over the next four days, moderate from snow to cold and more snow. We'll look at all those numbers in just a few minutes. Karen. Right. Always appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. Well, the battle to provide education for all during a pandemic just gets more and more complicated here in Michigan. State Superintendent Dr. Michael Rice is calling on the legislature to extend the school year. He says students need to make up for lost time. And our Paula Tumman reveals the idea comes with several challenges, including getting teachers on board. Start with one irrefutable fact. Teachers are exhausted. This school year in and of itself can't even last five minutes longer. We need a break. Educators need a break. Students need a break. Couple that with what's now being called the COVID slide. If you have a student, say, in fifth grade who's reading at a third grade level in the best of times, you know, to, to try to apply some mathematical formula to say that they're a year or two, it's... It's hard to say, but uh, I can assure you that um, the recovery from this is going to take years. Three to five years is my guess. And you have a mammoth hill to climb to find a way to get students caught up in a way that they can advance with core competencies. And while it's being suggested that public school districts find ways to extend the school year. Everybody thinks that we have a magic wand and can just like, ta-da, this is what we think and this is what we should do. 
But we have 1,100 locals across the state, Paula, and they have significant opinions of their own. They know their communities the best. Yes, teachers want to get back into the classrooms. Many still have grave concerns, however. I would be remiss if I said that uh, a lot of my union members are happy about coming back. They're very concerned and understandably so. But again, I think we have to start somewhere. That doesn't mean that this can't be adjusted and modified, but we have to make some steps towards in-person learning. Pushback from our teachers, I think is very justified given many of them uh, may have their own medical accommodations or uh, I've really come to appreciate how many people during this COVID crisis actually care for family members in their own homes who may uh, be exposed um, through uh, contact that someone uh, such as a teacher that goes out into the classroom and brings it back home. And so that means in order to extend anything, terms have to be negotiated. Anticipating possible possibly extending a year next year could be done if, in fact, the local educators decided they were going to work with the school system, open up their contracts, talk about where they could find days to remediate. But again, that has to be done locally, and educators will have to be compensated for that. Okay, so fair warning, if this feels like deja vu all over again, well, it's not your imagination. Karen, you, you may remember how chaotic it seemed in March and April when the school districts started getting ready to go remote and had to go into remote again in August and September when they tried to figure out whether or not to get kids back into school and so expect it now, expect things to change. Some school districts, they had been already working on this plan before anything was even announced, and we'll take a look at some of those plans coming up at six. All right, look forward to that report. Thank you, Paula. Well, the number of new COVID-19 cases in Michigan has increased just slightly in the past 24 hours. Today, the state is reporting nearly 1,400 new cases. Yesterday, the number was 1,200. Now, we have also seen an additional 32 deaths. That brings the total number since the crisis began to well above 14,000. In spite of the daily increase, new cases seem to have plateaued, and the seven-day positive testing rate is just below 5%. AstraZeneca's COVID vaccine might be the first to prove it can offer a one-two punch against the virus. A new study suggests the vaccine developed with Oxford University can protect against COVID-19 and help slow the spread of the virus. The research still needs to be peer-reviewed, but the data summary released says the vaccine can reduce transmission of the virus by two-thirds after the first dose. Other vaccines might also help slow transmission, but that research just hasn't been done yet. Tonight at 6, Dr. Frank McGeorge will take a closer look at the results of that AstraZeneca study and what comes next. Nearly a month after the siege at the U.S. Capitol, members of Congress paid their respects to a police officer hero. Lawmakers have honored the late Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick. He was hit in the head with a fire extinguisher during the attack and died the next day. Today, the officer was also remembered as a man who loved his girlfriend, his dogs, and the New Jersey Devils. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's promise to the officer's family, his sacrifice, will never be forgotten. The ripple effects of the Capitol attack are still being felt as lawmakers try to move forward. There's been tension in the sharply divided Senate and the House is about to take action against one of its own members. Kimberly Gill with the very latest and community has been hard to come by in the halls of Congress. It really has. And Karen, good afternoon to you. It's been more than a month now since the new Congress was sworn in. Just today, the new majority leader Chuck Schumer announced an agreement to organize the split chamber. Senate Democrats and Republicans are split 50-50, which allows Vice President Kamala Harris to break any ties. The two parties have finally agreed to a power sharing agreement that will allow Democrats to take control of Senate committees and set up other operations. But the House of Representatives is headed for a showdown over the future of Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. The Georgia Republican has embraced con conspiracy theories and violent racist views online. Should point out many of the posts are from before she was elected. A top Democrat says the full House could vote tomorrow on removing Taylor Greene from her committee assignments, which is a very rare move. Yeah, Marjorie Taylor Greene's uh, rhetoric has been characterized as loony, crazy, wacky, dangerous by Senate Republicans, not House Democrats, by Senate Republicans. 
At this point, no Republicans are stepping forward, though, to de defend Green. She uh, met with House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy for 90 minutes yesterday, but aides didn't reveal much about that meeting. House Republicans can act on their own to remove Taylor Green from her committees, but have refused so far to do so. A full House vote would force every Republican to go on the record defending or punishing the controversial Congresswoman. All of this happening when Congress is also working on the next COVID relief bill. We'll have an update on that part of the story coming up tonight on the news at five. For now, Karen, we'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Still ahead, first at four, fake vaccine bust. Dozens are arrested and investigators tell us what was really inside the bogus product. Also, credit card fraud. We'll talk about a scheme that cost American banks millions of dollars. And later, would you require wedding guests to get the COVID vaccine before coming to your big day? We're getting some new insight into how the pandemic has been affecting wedding plans.